So welcome everyone on YouTube as well to this edition of the Magnets Seminar. For everyone who is new, here's a quick rundown of what to expect. The presentation itself will be about 25 to 30 minutes long. And after that, we'll have 10 to 15 minutes for questions and discussions. Please keep your microphone muted until then. And if you don't have a working microphone, then feel free to post your questions in the chat. After the questions time, there will be a bit of time for a bit of a social catch up, which will not be recorded. For this week's seminar, we are happy to have Yasmina Matos from NASA and University of Maryland. And she will be talking about revealing Curie depth and geothermal heat from magnetic anomalies. So Yasmina, if you want to share your screen, then the floor is yours. And you're muted. No, I guess. Much better, perfect. Okay. Um, I am trying to hide that bar right now. <laughs> we can't yeah. see it, so it's good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, yes. So, uh, well, thank you. Uh, Dan for the introduction and thank you uh, to all of you for inviting me to give this talk and to tell you uh, or to discuss about magnetic anomalies and revealing curry depth and your thermal heat flow. So here for I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is just to introduce somehow uh, a little bit the concept of magnetic anomalies and how we get from there to um, uh, the location of the degree temperature in the lithosphere. Um, for these, all the studies I'm, I'm going to show, I just uh, also want to thank uh, some of my co-authors like Manuel Catalan or David Bourne. Um, so let's start here. So when we go to the field, um, we measure magnetic field on Earth. So this, this picture that you are seeing here in the lower uh, left, this is a magnetometer. We are measuring magnetic fields offshore somewhere in Antarctica. But we, we are, this instrument is collecting the magnetic field related to the main field of Earth, the, um, the field, uh, the external field interactions, and also the crustal field. And um, the crustal field is what we are going to call the magnetic anomaly. So from those measurements, we need to extract that magnetic anomaly. And the magnetic anomalies are very useful uh, because they are going to um, help us to understand what lies beneath the surface. So we can define a magnetic anomaly as the change in magnitude of the Earth magnetic field with respect to the expected value for this particular location. This is a 2D model of a, a location in the Southern Ocean. Um, the panel at the top is magnetic anomaly that you see that the amplitude goes my, from minus 300 to 400 nanoteslas. And there is some wiggles here. So these wiggles are telling us something that is buried um, beneath that surface. And there are contrast on magnetic properties beneath that surface within the crust. So in the model, we identify here two uh, blocks with um, different magnetic susceptibility and in this case are representing continental blocks. And it's not an absolute values. These values are not absolute. It's just a contrast and magnetization, a contrast in magnetic susceptibility. So magnetic anomalies are telling us something about this contrast beneath the surface. Uh, another way to use magnetic anomalies is to understand oceanic spreading magnetic anomalies. This is an example uh, also from the Southern Ocean, where we use, or oh, where well, uh, these authors use uh, magnetic anomalies. So this will be the spreading axis. <clears throat> and we can follow the symmetry on these magnetic anomalies to uh, give a date to this uh, particular location in the ocean. So we can use <clears throat> magnetic anomaly to, pro to provide timing in terms of continental drifting, for example. So, uh, in terms of worldwide, we have a world digital magnetic anomaly map. And I just want to emphasize that these colors that we see in blue and red or pinkish, 
they, they are reflecting this contrast of the magnetic bodies that are buried beneath the, the surface. Of course, there are locations that because they are very remote, we don't have enough resolution and that happens a lot in the Southern Ocean or in this case in Antarctica. What I want to say here is that we use magnetic anomalies to understand also uh, geological provinces. In this case, in Antarctica, we, we can follow the Antarctic Peninsula or we can even follow the coast of Antarctica. And we can also distinguish some spreading magnetic anomalies in, the, in this part, which is called the Weddell Sea. But as I said, there are uh, parts that are uh, logistically very complicated on Earth. So we have gaps in terms of this data also in the ocean. Um, so another way to use magnetic anomalies is to estimate this uh, Curie depth. So the Curie temperature is the temperature at which uh, the ferromagnetic elements lose their magnetism and become paramagnetic about this temperature. So using magnetic anomaly maps, uh, we can estimate the depth at which we reach this temperature within the lithosphere. And then with that, we can determine a thermal boundary condition that we can then later use to, to estimate geothermal heat. Here, I'm gonna um, um, focus on Curie temperature or Curie depth estimates using a spectral analysis. So the first thing we need to have is a compilation of magnetic anomaly data. And these compilations, if they are continental wide, like Antarctica, uh, that is something, it's a huge international effort and it takes decades to get, right? <laughs> so it's not something that we just go to the field and do it. Then we apply spectral analysis uh, that depends on the geology of a region. So we, we, uh, we apply this spectral analysis with some sort of knowledge of this area in terms of crustal thickness, for example. And then we do the Curie depth estimate and later we do the thermal model. So let's be, uh, start with the spectral analysis. What we are gonna do, if we are assuming that this is the surface, uh, the blue polygon is the crust or the lithosphere and the orange polygon is a magnetic body. So with the spectral analysis, we are going to determine the depth to the top and the depth to the centroid of this <clears throat> uh, magnetic body. And through uh, a mathematical relationship between these two, we, we are going to get the depth to the bottom, which uh, in this particular case, we are going to relate the depth to the base of this uh, magnetic body to the Curie depth. Uh, not only me and my co-authors, uh, all the people working on these techniques, we acknowledge that there are limitations on the techniques, and it could be that the, that depth to the bottom of the magnetic source, it could be that it's not exactly the Curie depth in that particular location. But one thing that we know is that the most abundant magnetic mineral in the lower crust is magnetite and um, the Curie depth will potentially be uh, in the lower crust. So in uh, for uh, determining the, the determining this um, Curie depth and the spectral analysis, as I said, we need a magnetic anomaly map compilation. And this map is divided in windows. The and they these windows overlap. So the windows the size of this window depends on the suspected geology of a specific location, but we do trials with different sizes. And then the spectrum is analyzed for each of these windows, it can be uh, you know, thousands of windows for a particular location, and the windows are analyzed in terms of wavelengths. So we look at windows thousands and thousands of times. And um, this is just an example with uh, some, of, some windows of, uh, in this case, I think it's Antarctica, where we analyze the spectrum of these particular windows. And then looking at wave numbers, depending on the range, we can determine either the depth to the top or the depth to the bottom. I'm not gonna go into detail of this because it really requires uh, more than uh, 20 minutes or half an hour. But I'm going to spend more time in this uh, diagram. So I'm going to focus on this method, the spectral method that 
we use, which is called the fractal spe spectral methods. There are different authors who have worked on this, uh, but I I'm citing Bulligan here. Um, so here, what we have is uh, we take the spectrum, the power spectrum of allocation. Uh, in this particular sketch, we have Antarctica. And then we analyze the spectrum. So this PF will be the uh, observed spectrum. And then we start analyzing what is called the, the, the fractal or the, the spectrum related to the random magnetization modeling. So this alpha is a fractal parameter. and It goes between 0 and 2. So we start trying parameters between 0, so 0 0.1, 0 0.2, until 2. Then we calculate the, the fractal power spectrum, which is the PR. <clears throat> and with that, we estimate the depth to the top, the centroid, and the bottom, and then obtain a synthetic spectrum. This is an example. For example, for alpha 0, we have the red line is the observed spectrum. Then we have the, the, the fractal spectrum, which will be this uh, blue line, and the synthetic spectrum. So that is spectrum based on those other calculations. And then we, this is only the case for the example for three of the alphas. Then we compare all this synthetic spectrum and the fractal power spectrum. Uh, and, and then we record the results until we reach alpha equals two. Then we let the compare all of them and find the one that gives you the minimum average residual. And then, so we have found over alpha for that particular location. And then we can start computing and calculating the depth to the top, to the centroid and the bottom for each window, which also in turn will depend on, on different wavelengths. So we applied the, the fractal spectral method uh, in, in different locations. I'm gonna show all of them. This, uh, we are looking now at Antarctica. Antarctica was divided in 1,100 windows. The size of these windows uh, was found to be optimized uh, for sizes of 350 by 350 kilometers and an overlap of 57%. I will show later, uh, I think it's in Greenland, the position of the central location of some of these windows, of all the windows. And in the case of, Eastern, of Antarctica, it's a huge continent. Um, it's very uh, different in terms of geology. So East Antarctica, which is this part here, and uh, West Antarctica needed to be treated differently in terms of wavelength and spectral analysis. For uh, Greenland, Greenland is, is much smaller than Antarctica. And here, the number of windows was 260 but the size it was also 350 by 350 kilometers as uh, we are dealing with a, a cratonic region. Uh, this part, this island was treated uh, as a whole. So there was no division in terms of different provinces. And the other location is the Scotia Sea. For this one, we used 1,456 windows, uh, but the size of these windows was much smaller than for Antarctica and Greenland because this is a continental, uh, sorry, an oceanic lithosphere. So we are expecting the depth to the bottom to be closer to the surface than in Greenland or Ant Antarctica, for example. And here the overlap was a 50%. So let's look at the results for uh, each of these locations. For example, for Antarctica at the left, this is the Curie depth estimated for Antarctica. And we see a huge contrast between, in between East and West Antarctica, which, which was expected because we, we, we know by all the authors and techniques that what lies beneath the ice sheet in East Antarctica is more cratonic or older than what we have in East Antarctica. So we expect uh, to have a shallower Cree depth in, for example, the uh, Antarctic Peninsula or the West Antarctic Rift, the Rift System, and deeper Cree depth in East Antarctica, although some shallower areas like the Lambert Rift, this is a rift region, so it's uh, understandable that we will find Cree depth shallower in this 
rifted area that in the interior of East Antarctica. So, but these values range uh, maybe like 15 in, in West Antarctica and 50 in East Antarctica. Also, the spectral method uh, with that, we can calculate or we can compute uncertainties related to the method. And when we obtain this with the map that you see at the right, this is an uncertainty map for Curidef, which is mostly uh, low for uh, Antarctica for the entire thing, for the entire continent, like two, four kilometers. I know we have these locations. These locations are related to, let me go back here, to gaps in airborne data that needed to be filled with satellite data. So we need to have something to be able to, to give estimate. So the gaps have, of course, higher, um, higher uncertainties than where we have urban data. For Greenland, the left is the Curidef, the estimated Curidef, where shallower values are found in the eastern part and in the southern part but deeper, deeper um, values are found in the northern part. So the right map is the uncertainty for the Curida for Greenland. These dots that you are seeing all over the place, they are um, referring to the center part of that window that has been used to apply the spectral analysis. So as you see, it's all covered by a by all these windows, the entire region. So we not only use magnetic field data that is over the continent, but also around the continent to be able to apply this technique and to see the contrast. So uh, the depth to the top, to the bottom, and the centroid is computed for this particular centroid position of the window, but is understood to be a representation of that region of the window, okay. For the Scotia Sea between South America and, and Antarctica, the Antarctic Peninsula, the top is the Curidef, and what we see is shallower values close to the, uh, to the South American continent, and also in this part of what we call the Drake Passage, and also towards the, the Weddell Sea, and deeper values like somehow in the central part of the West Scotia Sea. And uncertainties are again similar to uh, like in other locations, like uh, between two, there are locations that uh, are higher, like this, for example, in the South Arnie microcontinent, we reach like six uh, kilometers, but this is also assumed to be a very, very deep um, curry depth. So from here, uh, now that we have established the depth to the bottom of the magnetic sources using this spectral analysis, uh, we are also accepting that this is the Curie depth. Then we now can um, impose a boundary condition to solve the heat equation. So we uh, work with the heat equation to in one dimension and under steady state conditions, and um, there are parameters like the thermal conductivity or the heat production uh, at the surface, which are very difficult to know, right? Unless we go there and take samples and measure. And you can imagine in Earth polar regions, this is very complicated because everything is covered by ice. Or in the ocean, it's very complicated also to do this. Um, what we do in that case, well, one thing is in terms of the boundary condition with temperature, we are assuming magnetite for the Curie temperature at the bottom of the magnetic source. And we are doing this because we know that the most abundant mineral in the lower crust is magnetite. So it's a way to do this. And in terms of the heat production, the thermal conductivity, and the scale depth, we use local values that had been measured at these particular locations. So, we, and then our model is optimized by comparing these outputs from uh, our calculations and comparing them with the local values. 
So something that I want to emphasize is that the uh, your thermal heat flow, it's also a great parameter to understand a region. So, uh, so we are using magnetic anomalies to understand a region. We are using the Curie depth, and then we are using your thermal heat. So all of these uh, three um, parts are integrated to understand a region. And your thermal heat give us also an idea of what's going on underneath the ice, the surface of the lithosphere, and also can tell us about processes and history. And or in another, that will be from the surface down, but if we look from the surface up, heat flow and their patterns have consequences about the surface and especially about pol uh, in polar regions. And I will say why. <clears throat> in terms of looking down, uh, for example, in an oceanic domain, it controls the thermal subsidence. And in a, a continental domain, it can give us clues about tectonically active uh, provinces. For going up, your thermal heat flow really controls ice dynamics and it influences uh, because it influences the base of the ice sheet. Uh, your thermal heat flow, it's a very uh, it's a difficult parameter to measure in situ. So we there are several techniques that, that I have uh, written here on the slides, but uh, you see these are all these dots are uh, measurements on the ocean, but you can see for example the Pacific around Point Nemo there is basically nothing there, and as you can imagine as you can imagine if you go to polar regions like Greenland or Antarctica you cannot just drill holes everywhere on the ice and take measurements of your thermal heat. So we really need indirect measurements. Uh, or indirect techniques to be able to pro provide knowledge in certain regions. So here, uh, I have been showing how to, to try to do this using magnetic properties. Also, this diagram, uh, I put this diagram here to show you how your thermal heat can really impact the ice sheet dynamics. So all this diagram, I'm not going to talk about all these aspects, but these are solid earth factors that impact the ice sheet dynamics. So your thermal heat flow uh, has an impact that goes from continental scale to local scale. And the impact also goes from uh, thousands of years to giga years. Because as I said, it drives uh, the thermal state of the bottom of the ice sheet. So how does uh, then the geothermal heat flow looks in these three locations that I've been showing where we calculated a uh, crida from magnetic uh, anomalies? So this is the heat flow for <clears throat> Antarctica. So this is the parameter uh, estimated for the ice rock interface. And we see that East Antarctica it's, uh, much, uh, it presents much lower values than West Antarctica, which uh, we, we, have, uh, we think is reasonable since this is a much older region than West Antarctica. So in West Antarctica, we can find values above 150 millivolts meter square, while in East Antarctica, values don't reach further than like 80, 85 millivolts meter square. But we see that, for example, a rifted region has higher values than the surrounding areas. All of these, well, the black dots that you are seeing here, they are circulation lakes. And then all the different symbology, except these white ones, they are these local values that I mentioned before, where these parameters have been measured in situ. We could also compute um, the uncertainties, considering already the uncertainties from the spectral technique also. And what we see that it's the map at the right, and these are low values around 10 milliwatt uh, meter square. So here we are using uh, your thermal heat to really differentiate uh, geological provinces. If we go to Greenland, what we see is a higher geothermal heat in the eastern part, also the southern part. And this uh, band north uh, that trends northwest to southeast, which is uh, of higher values than the rest. But in overall, the values in Greenland are lower than in Antarctica, but we are dealing with a cratonic region uh, in its entirety mostly. 
And then in terms of uncertainties, this is, uh, although you see colors here, you can see the color bar, it just ranges between 10.6 to like 11, so let's say like 11 millivolts um, meter square, which is very similar to the one in Antarctica. So in this case, in, in Greenland, uh, magnetic anomalies, crew depth, geothermal heat, and also some gravity modeling told us a little bit about the history of Greenland. Uh, basically, uh, geothermal heat told us that Greenland in the past was in more southern latitudes, and then on its way north, it went over the Iceland hotspot. And this heat that the uh, mantle plume provided at the base of the lithosphere of Greenland was recorded as form of heat. And this is this band that we are seeing. We also performed some uh, substance analysis on this plume that also indicated that uh, it's cooling now. So it could be that uh, many millions of years, we will not see this band anymore because it has cooled completely off. And for the case of uh, the Scotia Sea, this is um, maybe a more complex uh, situation in terms of what's going on here with the heat flow. But summarizing, we are seeing higher values that goes around South America and along the borders or the boundaries of the ocean, also within uh, towards the Weddell Sea. Um, we are associating this with, or we associated this in, in the past and uh, nowadays to a thenospheric flow flowing from the Pacific to the Atlantic. So we could see that with uh, this technique. But all of this is possible because we have magnetic anomalies and we can do, we can apply indirect methods to understand geodynamics in a region. So as a summary, uh, very important. Magnetics is a fantastic tool to determine curry depth within the lithosphere and geothermal heat flow. Then geothermal heat flow can help us understand uh, what, what we have beneath the surface. What, what do we have beneath the ice sheet, an ice sheet or beneath any surface? It can tell us the history of a region, like in the case of Greenland. And something to not forget is that geothermal heat flow has implications on the ice dynamics at the base of the ice sheet because it basically drives that sliding. Um, yeah, so thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Let's all give Jason a virtual round of applause. And with that, I can open a room for questions. Peter, do you want to read it out or do you want me to read it? I can, I can read it out. Uh, how do you go from curry depth to heat flow? Okay, let's go over here. Oh no, not here. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the, this slide. Yep. Okay, so uh, the uh, curry depth, we are assuming it's a um, boundary condition at the bottom of uh, the lithosphere, and um, we have the heat equation. In, in order to solve this uh, equation, we need to have uh, boundary conditions. One is the temperature at the base, uh, which is the curry temperature, and we, with the spectral analysis, we have obtained the depth at which we find the curry temperature of the magnetite. And the other one is the temperature at the drug or at the surface, let's put it that way. And then we solve that this equation. And this equation contains this H0 here, is the heat production at the surface. And that's something that we uh, go through values, uh, the same for thermal conductivity and scale depth. Thermal conductivity, we have it here, and this is the scale depth. We go through values, so a range of values that uh, we know they are present in nature. So we go through all those values, so it's an, in the, an iterative process, and then we compare all the model outputs that we obtain for a particular region with local values that exist there. 
So when we find uh, a good agreement with this, that's when we can see that we have found the most appropriate thermal conductivity for a sample. Okay, thank you. There's another question just by Leo. Uh, hi, Yasmina, thank you for the great talk. There are quite a few factors and assumptions going into the heat flow estimate. What do you think is the most important factor affecting the confidence of your estimate? I think we, of course, one thing is, are we really, what well, we are assuming to be the depth, uh, first, we calculate the depth to the bottom of the magnetic source through this spectral analysis. Is this really the Curie depth in this particular location? I think that's probably one of the most uncertain, or one of the assumptions that we need to make that is harder to test. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Florencia. I do oh. have a question. So, uh, Jasmina, very nice talk. Uh, I saw in the map you show of Antarctica, a heat flow from Antarctica. Oh, okay. Let's there, go there, there were like three positive heat flows, heat flow anomalies. So, what there is an idea of what do they belong? Like, I mean, geologically, example. there's an yeah. explanation. For example, here, uh, this coincides with the West Antarctic Rift system. I haven't said this, for example, but that coincides with this. Um, this um, we don't see this here, but in, the, look, in this location, we have an oceanic basin that was open at some point, right? So we have mm -hmm. uh, some um, like thinner tectonics. Crust. The tectonics there, we had also in the past a subduction zone here. Um, there are different tectonic processes that have influenced okay. this. Also, there are many volcanoes here. These white okay. dots are volcanoes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, awesome. There's one more question in the chat by Gunther. Is opposing magnetic remanence to current geomagnetic field an issue for your calculations? No, no, it's uh, they they are, you know, when you measure magnetic fields, you're measuring everything, and no, it's nothing different than you have to do. It's just a magnetic property; it's there in the body. Great. Um, I think we have time for one more question, if anyone has one. If not, then um, I can ask one. Ismi, you said, well, I think you said that your models are based on the assumption that the magnetization is, is carried in magnetite. Do you uh, have an idea about the uncertainty if that's not the case? Like titanomagnetite would be pretty common as well. Yeah, that's uh, that's. Uh, I I I understand your question. That's something that we think about a lot. But since magnetite is the most abundant and the one that has the highest um, uh, query temperature, uh, we use that one. Uh, not only us, basically most of the people who apply this method. Fair enough. I guess yeah. it would get a bit more complex. It's one of this, yeah. Maybe if you have like really an understanding of a particular location, you may be able to say more details about the the lower crust. But it's it's pretty challenging. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I'm seeing any more questions. And if that is the case, then let's all thank Yasmina one more time. I can find the button, I can do it too. And I am going to thank you. share my slide.
one more time. Right, uh, thank you everyone for being here. As you can see, we have two more talks set up on the 29th of March and 12th of April. After that, we are going to take a break for AGU, uh, EGU, AGU is already behind us. And we are of course always looking for more speakers, especially early career scientists. If, so if you know any, let them know to contact us. And also, this video, as all the other seminars, will be posted on our YouTube channel. So check it out, leave us some likes. And with that, I will see you all again next time. Thank you, and bye-bye.